Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did for science. What power? What power? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the Churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? <laughs> Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. In the Church of Christ, we teach that, the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. What the? What the? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good, e good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word of the Lord. James Olfer here with you, and uh, we are always glad for you to tune in and uh, study the Bible with us tonight. We want to put our content information up here for you to, uh, to see. If you would like to uh, have any of our DVDs or TV programs, or Bible studies, or anything that we can do for you, we want to... Certainly let you know how to reach us. You can reach me at 276-340-2653. Um, we meet at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden. And uh, you can reach me at wordfromlord.gmail.com. <clears throat> and uh, we'd certainly like to hear from you and let you know and, and know that you are watching the program. And if you have any questions, we uh, will be glad to answer them. It may be a topic that, uh, that you're asking that we would say would be beneficial and uh, useful to uh, discuss on the air. And so it may be something that everybody's thinking about. We may uh, just take the initiative to uh, talk about that thing. So maybe there's a program that you'd like to see or some information you'd like to hear from the Bible. I mean, what, does, uh, what, what does the Bible have to say about or what, does, what is uh, taught 
as a result of, of a certain subject, and so we would be glad to, you know, do that very thing and study with you. If you'd like to stay with us, of course, Sundays and uh, Thursdays are when we meet. Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, worship at 10 a.m., uh, Bible study at 7 p.m. on Thursday nights, and so I want you to come out and visit with us, or if you're in the Martinsville area, the Danville area, 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville, it's where you can meet with those saints there on Sunday mornings at 9, 10, and 11. 11 o'clock is their worship, and then they have... Uh, they have another assembly at 9 and, and a Bible class at 10, but their worship is at 11. And, uh, of course, in, in Danville, 120 American Legion in Danville, uh, Sundays at uh, 10 and 11 as well, worship at 11, and uh, Bible class on Tuesday nights in Danville, Wednesday nights in Martinsville, Thursday nights in Eden. So uh, come, out, come out and be with us, and, uh, you know, let's study God's Word together. Uh, Tonight, I want to continue a, a topic that we started last week, and I said we were going to continue some information about this. Uh, it's really the idea that we're trying to all be on the same page and what it takes to be unified, what it takes to be walking together. A, uh, Amos said, can two walk together except to be agreed? Amos 3 and verse 3. And so really, this is what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to all be on the same page. Now, I started off with this, with this video clip from... Uh, uh, from Dick Jansen, from one of the Headlighters program. I think it's actually the same one that ran tonight. Uh, is uh, it was a rerun. So uh, let's uh, uh, you know let's just let's just listen to what he's what he's saying. Well, uh, he's talking about all being together. He doesn't use the term same page, but he says let's all be together. Let's hey, see what know, he has to say. I don't think Johnny's going to like this, but we often hear about a, a lot of times people will call into Johnny's shows or call them when they're on the and, and you know. It, Remark. It's just, I just don't get, not so much an attack, but why the negativeness? I mean, in order for some, in order for two ends to come together and create something more magical, both ends have to be on the same agreement. They both have to have the same idea and the same end game in mind. Right, and if they don't, then it don't here's work. A tough question. And, uh, okay, know, so I don't if, think Johnny's gonna like. If, if, if we're not in agreement, then, then it won't work. And that's, that's really, you know, that's a true statement. If we're trying to do something and come something together, then we all have to be on the same page. We have to be in the same agreement. And that's really what we're, we're trying to focus on. So, friends, what, what is it going to take to then be on the same page? Now, last time, <clears throat> last, uh, uh, last week, we talked about from a religious standpoint, what's it going to take for everybody to be on the same page religiously? And it comes down to uh, having the same authority, you know, uh, agreeing that we're going to get our marching orders or we're going to follow a pattern that everybody agrees to. And if everybody agrees to that pattern, then we'll all be together. And so that's what it's going to take, religiously speaking, for us all to be together and, and walk together and accomplish uh, great things in the community. Listen, Jesus prayed in John 17 and verse 21 Jesus prayed for unity. Uh, he prayed that we that uh, all might be uh, one. And he says uh, in John 17, verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their words, that they may, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may believe, that they may be one in us, and believe that thou hast sent me. Now, so... Unity is going to come through God's Word. Now, friends, let's think about it. If we're going to have unity, it's not going to come from the division that so many people claim that, that we can have and still be pleasing to God. If we can be unified, if we can have unity the way the denominational world, the, the religious world says it, then Jesus is wrong. Jesus didn't know what he's talking about. And I deny that. I believe Jesus knew exactly what he's talking about and that we're all going to be unified through the Word. We have to come to an agreement on what that standard is, what that, what that authority is, in order to, to be like Amos says, the verse we read earlier, to, to walk together and be on the same page. Now, tonight we're going to go in a little different direction because it may be that somebody is not so big on religion. And maybe someone thinks, well, you know, we can accomplish, uh, we can all get along and have a, a, a good peaceful coexistence together 
And we don't need religion. We don't need uh, uh, all these uh, uh, religious groups and the Bible thumpers and so forth. And besides, you look at all the, the corruption that's, that's come as a result of, of in the name of religion. So let's just don't have religion. As a matter of fact, let's just look again at the same video, the same, the same program, Headliner Show, and let's listen again to what is being said about religion. And then let's go from there. Let's, what happens if we take religion out of the equation? Let's listen. I look at the Muslim religion, or Muslim religion seems like one of the craziest. Um, I mean, the 72 version concept, um, you know, where they say people go out and, you know, you, if you kill somebody, do what we, do what we need you to do, you're going to get magically 72 versions. So why don't the leaders do it? I mean, yeah. you, you would think <laughs> that they would be the first ones to go start going, right? They, they get everybody else I, to I, I think there's a little bit of lunacy in all religions, yeah. which is why I'm so... And I'll probably get down for this, but yeah. that's why I'm sort of against religion. There's been so much... You don't, you don't have to have a religious background to be a decent person, to know what it takes to help other people out or have good morals. You don't need religion for that. I think I'm a fairly decent person. Mm -hmm. Could use a little improving. But, um, you know, heathen or not, I'm out there. I don't, I don't go out there. I mean, just... No more. You know, it's that bad in my mind. And, uh, you know, I don't think Johnny's going to like this, but we often hear about... A lot of times, people will call it. A okay, now that was a, that was a comment where we started last time. But do you hear, do you hear what what uh, Dick said? He said, "You know, I believe I'm a good person. I'm a decent person. Maybe need a little improvement here and there." And you know, some of those things that he's saying, I think everybody could say about themselves. And so I'm not downing I'm not downing Dick Jensen. I like Dick Jensen. We we have good conversations when we see each other. And uh, you know, I, I just I, I consider him a friend. But what he said, I think, is very telling, and it's probably something that a lot of people would say. You know, I'm not a bad person. You know, I don't go out and just sin a whole lot, and, you know, I may need some improvement here and there. I think we all could say that. But here's the thing, friends, when we're talking about morality, we're talking about things like, like what uh, uh, Dick said. You know, how are we going to be on the same page when it comes to saying what, uh, what is good and what is decent. You see, when someone uses terms like good and moral and right and decent and sin, I mean, as you said, I, you know, I don't, don't sin a whole lot, don't go out and sin a whole lot. And, uh, well, what does that mean? You know, what, what do those terms imply? Now, this is what we need to consider, friends. Sometimes when you hear something, you need to ask a question, not what did you say, but actually what did you not say, or what is being said kind of between the lines. Listen, when someone says or uses terms like good <clears throat> or right or moral or decent, there is an implication there. All right, there's an implication there. That means, that means that there is a way by which we can determine if something is good or right or moral or just, if something is wholesome, or if it's evil, if it's false, and so forth. So the question is, we've got to be on the same page on these things. We've got to be on the same page of determining what is good, what is moral, what is right, and how are we going to accomplish that? So... Here's the question. How are we going to do it? Well, let's start here. What is truth? Now, you sitting at home, you, you may be actually saying, well, I, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify them with thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay, but remember, remember, we, we just talked to an individual that says, I, I, don't want, I don't want to be a part of religion. I see what all the bloodshed and everything's been, shed, been done in the name of religion, so I don't really want that. We don't need that. So what we have to do is we have to, if we're going to come, uh, be on the same page, we may have to go, go around the mountain, so to speak. We can't go to the Bible directly because that's something that, that, that they're not really to accept. So we're trying to find common ground here. But what I'm going to tell you, friends, I'm going to show you that if we go around the mountain, you know where we're going to wind up? We're going to wind up back where we started. And then we'll be ready to climb that mountain. So that, let's go around the mountain, so to speak. Let's go around the mountain and see... What, what we're looking at here. 
What is truth? Or can we know what truth is? Is there something that is true? Can we know it as a fact? And that's what truth is. Truth is a, a, an undeniable fact. All right? And so when we're talking about finding truth, then if we know something is true, that means we can eliminate things that are false. Now think about this. If we know something is true, if we can know something is true, and I think most people are going to say, yes, we can know truth, then by definition, there has to be something that is not true. Now, in, uh, in recent months past, when, uh, uh, when, when the atheists would come on, and uh, would, would criticize us for saying, you know, uh, th those folks in the Church of Christ, they, they say that there is an, an objective truth. Well, is there an objective truth? Can we know something is true or not? Because if, there, if you say no, there's not an objective truth that we cannot know what is true, then you've just stated that you knew something. How can you know something is not true without, and, and then turn around and say you can't know it? And so, friends, what we're really realizing is uh, we all admit that there is a way to know truth and we can determine what is true and what is false. We can determine if something is right or something is wrong. And if something is false, then there must be a truth. If something is true, then there must be something that's false. It, just like if there's something that's right, then there has to be something that's wrong. If something is, is true, it has to be false. There's something that has to be false. If there's good, there has to be an evil. If there's, a, if there's a black, there has to be a white. If there's an up, there has to be a down. See, it's all, it's all together. You cannot have one without the other. And the way we know what truth is, the way we know what right is, the way we know that what something is decent or good has to be because we're comparing something with something else. Now, friends, if I told you, if I told you that I am tall, if I told you I'm tall, now you may not can tell how tall I am on TV. Some of you see me in person, say I look different or whatever. You, know, you might say, well, in person you look, you look taller, you look shorter. But if I said I'm tall, you might say, well, well, James, that's fine, but compared to what? See, what is tall? What is tall? If I go, if I go over to, say, North Korea, I suspect that I will be very tall compared to the average person in that country. But if I go to a, a, a stand next to an NBA basketball team, guess what? I'm not tall. And what makes the difference is you have something to compare to. And so when you're looking at comparing things, you can say, well, this one's tall or this one's short. James, you're, you're tall compared to this man, but you're short compared to this man. Compared to Mark, I'm short. See that? Compared to my daughter, I'm tall. And so there has to be a, 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 a standard that we're using. Same thing with right and wrong. If someone says, Something is true, how do you know it's true? What are you comparing it to? If something is something's good, what, how do you know? What are you comparing it to? Good compared to what? And so, uh, but, but truth is an absolute. You know, there is no, well, it's, you know, it, it's truer than this or falser than that. When we're talking about a right and wrong in morality, there has to be an absolute truth. Now, here's why I'm saying this. Friends, do you realize that if someone says they don't want religion or if they say it's not needed, that you can be good and decent and moral without it, they are still saying, they're still saying that they believe that morality exists. They're just saying you don't need the Bible to show it, that you don't need God to define it. All right? So, but, so they're still saying that morality exists. Now, when we're talking about morality, we're talking about this line between good and evil. We're talking about a, that morality is what determines what is good and what is bad. 
what is right and what's wrong, what's just and what is unjust. Now, when you say that we can have this without the Bible, then you have to then answer the question, what is the standard that you're laying down to compare and put good on one side and bad on the other? See, here's what I mean. Everybody who talks about morality, and I'd say everybody, even even they may not use the term morality, they're going to talk about good and evil. They're going to talk about right and wrong. And everybody is going to have a line that they would draw in the sand and say, all right, anything past this is bad. Anything on this side is good. So where do you draw the line? See, where do you draw the line? Where is, it, where is it that you're going to draw the line and say, okay, everything over here is evil. This is evil, and this is good. Now, if, if, if we started talking and we started naming some things, somebody, somebody's going to move the line back and forth. But the very fact that we're using terms good and evil indicate that we have a standard somewhere that's going to help us to, to say, hey, this is good, this is, this is right, this is honest, this is decent. All right? To some degree. To some degree. Now, just like I said about comparing my height, I may be taller than some or shorter than the others. But what that implies is somewhere there is a standard by which we measure the height of all men. See that? We haven't really talked about the yardstick or the tape measure, but when you talk about someone is taller than another or shorter than another, you're implying that somewhere behind the scenes there is a standard that you're using to measure height. And so when someone says good or bad or evil or decent or 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 wholesome, whatever, it's implied that behind the scene, somewhere is a standard that ultimately is going to be the determining factor about what is good and what is evil. The question is, where are you going to draw the line between good and evil? How is that line even going to be drawn? Who or what is going to determine about the line between good and evil? Now see, that's what we're talking about. Someone says, well, I'm, I'm a good guy. Well, okay, I'm a tall guy. It gets not, compared to what? Compared to what? So, well, I'm a good guy. I don't commit murders. Well, okay, so compared to Ted Bundy, yeah, you're a great guy. Compared to Ted Bundy, you're, you're a superb guy. But see, but do you cheat on your taxes? Do you cheat on your test in high school? Do you drive drunk? To that well, now, still compared to a mass murder, you're, you're you're not so bad. But compared to someone who doesn't cheat on their taxes or don't doesn't cheat on their homework in in school or doesn't drive drunk, well, you're a little bit worse. So where are you? And all of this is implying all this is implying that behind the scenes somewhere is a standard that says ultimately this is good and this is bad. Now, if you're trying to move away from the Bible, you're trying to move away from religion. You're saying, all right, let's just forget about the tape measure. But see, if you forget about that tape measure, friends, then you still have to determine where that line is going to be drawn and who is going to draw it. Who is going to draw it? Let's talk about some, some options here. I asked some of the brethren <clears throat> tonight, I said, you know, who's going to draw the line? They said, well, well, me or the individual. Okay, let's think about that. Is an individual going to draw the line between good and evil? There are some individuals that I would not want to draw that line. All right? So we have to ask the question, now, which individual? Are we going to fight over it? We're going to fight to get to see who, who draws the line about what is good and what is evil. Who's going to be the judge between what is good and what is evil? And whatever they say goes? Well, I don't think I want that person to have that much authority. And you may not want me to have that. I can assure you there's some people that wouldn't want me to be the judge because I would, I would put a lot of things on the evil side that they would say, oh, whoa, whoa, but that, that, that's good, you know? 
going out and have a little drink with the boys on Friday night, I'd put that on the evil side. They say, oh, no, that's good. That's good. See, you don't want me to draw the line. And I don't want you to draw the line. You may say, well, let's put, what's on the good side? Well, the good side is going out there and running women all night long. Oh, that's not good. Oh, yeah, it's good. See, well, we've got two different measuring sticks here. Two different standards that we're going by. So who gets to choose? Or is it each person's? Do you get to say, well, I'm going to do what's right with me, and you do what's right with you, okay? Well, that's all fine, well, and good until we meet. See that? It's all fine and good until we meet on the street, and you determine that what is good is for you to take my money. Now, I'm not so happy with your standard of right and wrong. Now, you may not have a problem with it, Obviously, you think it's right because you're going to do it, but I'm going to say, no. Now, our standards of right and wrong are going to meet, and they're going to clash, and we're not going to have harmony. We're not going to have unity. All right? So we have to figure out. So the individual is not a, not a really good idea. So maybe someone says, well, you know what? We'll just get a lot of people together, and we'll just vote on it. Now, here's what our society says. Our society says, let's vote. Let's vote to see, to see if something is good. And we'll make it a law. We'll legalize it. We'll legalize marijuana. We'll legalize euthanasia. We'll legalize uh, uh, drugs. And, you know, we'll legalize alcohol. We'll do all this. All right? Now, does that make it good because society said it was okay? Because a, the majority of people got together and voted on it and said, all right, now it's okay? Friends, I'll, I'll tell you this. In North Carolina, uh, we voted, I think, in the last election. There was a referendum that said uh, two, maybe, no, I guess it was two elections ago. Uh, North Carolina voted to make, the, make it legal, make, make it a legal requirement or legal status that, it is, that marriage is one man and one woman. Now, you know what, friends, just voting on that, and it passed, like 70%. 70% of North Carolinians said uh, marriage should be one man and one woman. Well, I'm glad they did, but you know what? That did not make marriage between one man and one, one woman. Everybody voting on it, 70% of the people voting on it, did not make that be what marriage is. What makes marriage one man and one woman is something beyond those 70% of people. See that? Now, we can legally define things all we want to. We can legally define marriage and redefine marriage, but that's not going to change what it really is. See that? Listen, you can, you can call spinach. You can call spinach uh, chocolate ice cream all you want to. I'm not going to eat it. Oh, but James, we redefine it. We redefine this chocolate ice cream. Uh-uh. That may be your standard for chocolate ice cream. I think I'll pass. So, you see what we're talking about? Just because a group thinks something is right does not make it so. Uh, look at this. In, in Acts chapter 23, Acts chapter 23, you have uh, Saul of Tarsus, and he is... Uh, giving his defense about his life. And he said, uh, he said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, what did he have a clear conscience about? It didn't bother him. He thought what he was doing was right. As an individual, he thought he was doing what was right. But you know what? I'm sure those Christians that he went and he... He killed, he drug out of their house and drug them back to Jerusalem, bound and, and, and sent them to death. He said, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did not like his standard of what's right and wrong. But he didn't have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, look what he says in Acts 26. Acts 26 and verse 9, he said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So here's that individual coming out. But notice where he got his right. Notice where he got the standard of it's okay for me to do this. Look what he says in verse 10. He says, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up 
in prison, having, <clears throat> having received authority of the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I had authority from the chief priest. Now, so we have an individual that says, hey, it's all right for me to kill Christians. And he says, I even got authority from certain individuals. Now, do you want the government to be your authority? I don't think that I do. Because I know what the government is. The government is made up of individuals. And so even if you have a group of individuals in power that are sitting there saying, this is what's right and this is what's wrong, that's not what's going to make it right and what's wrong. Because the government can come along and the government can say, hey, we'll just, we'll just kill a whole race of people. Now, are you sure that you want to put right and wrong in the hands of a, of a group of individuals? You know? Now, uh, let's, let's look back. Let's look back at this. So here we have, so here we have Saul of Tarsus, and he's and he's going out killing Christians. He said, "I have authority to do it." So legally, it was right. Legally, it was right. I mean, he actually says in Acts twenty six, uh, there in Acts twenty six and verse twelve. Notice he says, "Where uh, whereunto whereupon I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest." Uh, I went with authority and commission from the chief priest. He had the authority to do it. Now, is that was that right? Did that make it morally right? Because he had the authority from some uh, political officials to do it? If you think that's the standard that we're going to use, then you come talk to me when, when, uh, uh, when the government comes knocking on your door and says, you know what, I'm going to take all your guns. Or when the government comes and says, you know what? I think we're just going to haul you up to jail because you said something bad about the president or you said something bad about the governor. Oh, well, wait a minute. I, I, I don't think the government needs to have the moral uh, ability, the ability to determine what is morally right and morally wrong. Well, too bad. You said, hey, if, if it's legal, it's okay. You know what's happening in Colorado? It's legal for people to smoke marijuana. Now you know what they're doing? Now they're having trouble with people who are driving while they're high. Kids are, are uh, uh, ingesting marijuana, marijuana-laced food. <clears throat> and kids are even taking marijuana to school. Now who didn't see that coming? That's what we're talking about? But it's legal, so therefore it must be morally right. Is it morally right to give a child a drug? See, my friend, my whole point is there's something greater than simply someone's idea or someone's opinion that this is right or this is wrong. If it's morally right just because it's legal, then what if the laws change? Does that change the morality of it all? You mean if something's legal, then it's moral? Let me ask you this. Was it moral... Was slavery moral when it was legal? I say no. Now, if it's illegal, if it's illegal, does that make it immoral? No. What makes it immoral, what makes it moral or immoral has nothing to do with whether someone passed a law and said, well, we're going we're gonna to legalize it. You see what I'm saying, friend? Slavery was morally wrong regardless of what the law of the land said. And, and, and killing Christians was morally wrong regardless of what the law said. And so my whole point is there's something behind the scenes that people just don't want to admit. But there's a standard way, way back behind the scenes that is actually the greater guide to what is right and what is wrong. It can't be left up to the individual. It can't be left up to society. It can't be left up to the government. There must be something else. Otherwise, look at this. Look at this. If society is going to be the determining factor of good and evil, what are we going to say about this? Belgium is set to legalize euthanasia. Now, euthanasia is mercy killing. That is, taking someone or killing someone because their, their life is unfit by some standard. I, I don't know what the standard is. 
And typically you hear this about older people. You know, the Jack Kevorkian, you know, mercy killings and assisted suicide. That's euthanasia. But this, in Belgium, they're legalizing euthanasia not for older people. Now they're coming after the younger people. Here's what it says. It says uh, Brussels is expected to pass a new law abolishing the age restriction on euthanasia allowing terminally ill kids the right to die. What do you think about that? You see, we say, well, it is morally right because it's legal. It's legal and morally right for us to kill babies in the womb. We call it abortion. And that's legally right. Is it? Well, it may be legally right, but is it morally right? Well, you know, we all have a choice here. Does that make it moral? Now that we're doing well, you know, now they're terminally ill, so we're going to give them the right to kill themselves. Well, it's the right to die. They're terminally ill. Well, let's think about this, friends. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure, you know, I'm pretty sure I read the dictionary before one time, and it said that terminally ill means you're going to die anyway. You're going to die anyway. So what would be the purpose of killing this person? Well, we don't take up a hospital bed. You know, it cuts the cost. So, so more as you're telling me someone's life is being weighed about whether they're taking up a space in the hospital or whether they're racking up costs for medical, medical equipment or medical procedures? That's the value of human life? That's what we're getting down to? That's how we're measuring the value of a life? Does that sound morally right to you? Now, Belgium's not the only country that's doing this. Holland has already legalized it. For 12 years old. Friend, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that 12 year old is probably not saying, you know, Mom, Dad, I think the best thing to do is, you know, for me just to take myself out of this world, let me just, let me just go ahead and kill myself and save y'all some money. Really? Seriously, friend? Is this, what, is this our moral standard? Now you're saying, well, I can, be, I can be moral without religion. Okay, well then how are you going to determine what's morally right? What's, what's good, decent, and just? And, you know, what, what's a sin and what's not a sin? Sin against what? What, what's, what do you mean sin? I mean, the very term sin is, is taken from the book you want to talk about. Sin against what? Sin against whom? How? How are you going to sin? So, you see, friends, is society a good standard? Now, let me ask you this. If a society as a whole can determine what is, if something is right or wrong, and they say, well, morally, morally, it is right, what if another group, another society, another country, says, no, it's wrong. Who's going to be right? Can both people be morally right and morally wrong at the same time? Can something be morally right and morally wrong at the same time? Look, if I said to you, if I said to you, this wall behind me is all brick, made up 100% of brick, Friends, I can't then turn around and say it's made 100% out of wood. It cannot be all wood and all brick at the same time. But that's what you have when you have one country saying this is morally right and this is morally wrong on the same issue. For example, let's look at Russia. Russia says homosexuality is, is wrong. It's illegal. Now, is that moral or immoral for them to say that? You just said society can make the rules, okay. Russia has the rules that homosexuality is wrong. It's illegal. Now, in our country, you know, it's crammed down our throat that we have to accept homosexuality. Now, which country is morally right? Remember, society is setting the standards. Society is telling us what is right and what's wrong because we can't use the Bible. So what is right and what's wrong? 
Is Russia morally right or is Russia morally wrong? Is the United States morally right or is the United States morally wrong? Because you've got two things that are, that are opposites, and they both can't be morally right. But yet they have to be if you're saying, well, society chooses to do it. No, how about we say there's a standard that is laid down and is measured for both countries, and both countries have to live according to that standard. See that? That's what we're getting to. That's what we're getting to. Because if a country has a di if a country or a different group passes a contrary law, then you're gonna have conflict. Again, who's gonna do it? Now, friends, the reason why we're doing this, we're trying to get we're trying to get on the same page. We're trying to make sure that what we are saying and what we're doing is trying to find some common ground. That's why I would ask, that's why I would ask the individual that said, well, let's you know, I, I just don't want anything to do with religion because I can be a good person and, and I, won't, I don't sin that much without the Bible. Well, where are you using those terms for? Why are you using those terms? Unless you know that there is a standard that's going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. I, I asked the, uh, the brethren tonight, I asked him, I said, <clears throat> If you had never tasted anything but vanilla ice cream, and I came up to you and I asked you, said, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? You wouldn't say vanilla. You wouldn't say vanilla. You know what you'd say? You'd say, what do you mean what's your favorite flavor? Are there other, other flavors? Is there, is there another flavor of ice cream that I don't know about? As far as I know, there's only one flavor of ice cream. I have nothing to compare it to. Now, if I said, oh, you, you've never had any other kind of flavor of ice cream? Oh, no. Well, let's go down to Baskin Robbins then. They got 31 flavors. You can try them all. I actually had a friend one time. He said he'd go down to Baskin Robbins. He'd sample every flavor of ice cream. He sampled that, you know, they give you a little plastic spoon, you know, they give you a little bite. He sampled every one of them. And they said, all right, well, what can we give you now? He goes, I'll just have a scoop of vanilla. He tried them all. <laughs> he just ran and got vanilla. But see, if you don't know what to compare it to, then you're, you're not going to expect there to be any differences. But when someone says, well, I'm decent, I'm good, I don't sin, I'm, you know, pretty much an all right guy, by what standard? By whose standard? Because if you're using a standard, then I kind of want to know so that I can use that same standard. So that's what we're talking about. We're trying to get on the same page, but we've been told we can't use the Bible. We, we don't need religion. So how are we going to come to the same page? See, how, how are we going to get on the same page here? Uh, this is this is what we're what I'm trying to get you to see, uh, friends. If you're saying there's something good or bad and so forth, you're saying there is a moral law. It's that measuring stick, but that's that's behind the scenes that no one wants to talk about, but it's there. It's there. And so if you, admit, if you admit there is a moral law, there is some things that are better or worse than others, then you're admitting there is a standard by which you're determining something is worse than others. All right? Now, if there is a moral law then, and this is why it's so important, if there is a moral law that's behind the scenes that no one wants to talk about, but it's still there, if there is a moral law, then there must be a time and a place or a person who's going to uphold that moral law. Someone or something in some place at some point in time to justify everything that is 
contrary to that law. Now, here's what, here's what I mean by that. Do you think everyone in this life, do they get what they deserve? Good or bad, do they, are they going to get what they deserve? Not watch it. I said, are they going to get what they deserve? What I meant to say is, do they get what they deserve? In this life, do they get what they deserve? You know, we hear on, on, the, on television, news, whatever, uh, people who are in, in, in jail for the death penalty. They're, they're getting the death penalty. They, they get put to death. And then you say, oh, but you know, he was innocent. How many innocent people have been put to death by the death penalty? That's a fair question. And I'm sure there's been quite a few people who have been put to death who were innocent. They did not, they got something, they got more than they deserved. They, they didn't get what they deserved. I mean, if you've ever seen a Western, you know, you know, the cattle rustler, you know, he, he, he gets caught, he gets strung up, he doesn't get a trial. He really didn't do it, but, you know, he, he, he's accused of it, so, we're, you know, hang him high. Did he get what he deserved? No. There's a lot of people in this life, friends, that they don't get what they deserve. And there's a lot of people that get away with things that they deserve to be punished for. I mean, look at this. Look at this. Let's just look at Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah 12 and verse 1. Jeremiah says, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. He says, You're righteous. You're righteous. He says, But yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Let me just ask you a question about some of thy judgments. He says, Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Why, do, why does the wicked get away with so much? Now, Lord, you're righteous, I know, but let me, I just don't understand. Why does the wicked get away with so much? Wherefore, all the, wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Do you ever think about some of the things that people get away with? How is it that so much wickedness and corruption goes on and takes place, people just get away with it. And politicians, they embezzle, and they lie, and they steal, and they cheat. They just get away with it. I recall several years ago, I guess it's been 10 or so years ago, maybe more, 20 years ago, uh, all the politicians up in Washington writing checks, and they're bouncing, and oh, well, so what? No big deal. You know? Politicians drink, and Run off, a, run off a bridge and, and, and drown someone in the back seat. No, one, no, no, it's no, no big deal about that. Do you ever wonder why so many people get away with it? You know, celebrities, they, they do drugs and, you know, they can go all crazy in society and, oh, we just yuck it up. Let's, let's turn on entertainment tonight and TMZ and all the kind of gossip channels and let's just, let's just eat it all up. Boy, look, look at what the Kardashians are doing or whatever. You know, Justin, Justin Bieber, you know, boy, he's, he's, a, he's a hoot, isn't he? Oh, Miley Cyrus, boy, yeah, she's, she's, you know, they just, those young kids, you know. Are they being moral? Is what they're doing moral or immoral? And by what standard? Are they getting what they deserve? How many times do people get away with something and they deserve punishment? And so, Jeremiah's asking God, why is it that all this happens? Look, Job asked a similar question. Let's look at Job, chapter 21, verse 7. Job says, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? He said, Their seed is established in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. They have a lot of kids. Look at the Godfather, you know. The mob boss. Oh, they live nice and, you know, their kids are all around them. Said, oh, they're just doing fine. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. They're not worried about anything hurting them. Their bull gendereth and, their, and faileth not. Their cow calveth and calveth not her calf. Oh, look, their, their herds are multiplying. Boy, they're just making money hand over fist. Nothing ever stops them. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They just have a good old time. 
they take the timbrel and the harp and they rejoice in the sound of, of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down the grave. Therefore, they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. How is it the wicked, they get all this going for them? And nothing bad ever happens to them. And here's the honest, hard-working little man out here trying to carve out a life, you know, by the sweat of his brow, barely making his house payment, putting food on the table, trying to put uh, shoes on the, on the kid's feet. Why does he have it so hard? Why do the righteous have it so hard? Wait a minute, we're using terms righteous and wicked. By what standard are they righteous? What standard are they wicked? See, when we, when we talk about words, we're, we mean things. When we use these words, we're actually implying that there's a standard back here behind the scenes somewhere that, that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to admit, but yeah, it's back there. Ecclesiastes 7, in verse 15, look what Solomon says. He says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Now, how fair is that? Now, this is, this is my point, friends. If there is a moral law of right and wrong, if there is a standard of morality, who, when, what, where, why, how are people going to get what they deserved? You see, if you've got morality, that means you've got wickedness that deserves punishment and you've got goodness that deserves reward. That's morality. But where are we going to get, you know, where's it all going to balance out? If this life is over, if when this life is over, there's nothing else, then there really is no morality. Because morality means that there has to be something good, that's re a reward for something good, and punishment for something evil. So how is that going to take place? How is it going to take place? Can you do it? Can you... Can you give the reward that, the, that the, the good, decent, and honest people that don't seem very much that they deserve? Or can you punish those individuals that have done wickedly, that get away with it? How is that going to take place? The very fact that we are talking about good and evil means that there is a standard that runs along behind our lives that we're all going to be held up to. Now, remember I said we're going to come around the mountain? Somebody don't, we don't want to go over the Bible mountain, so what are we going to do? We don't want to go over the mountain of religion, so what do we got to do? We got to go around it. You know what? We went all the way around it. We went around it trying to find the standard for morality, and we come right back to the Bible. And it comes back to the fact, friends, that Society can't really determine what's morally right and what's morally wrong. The individual can't determine what's morally right and morally wrong. The government can't determine what's morally right and morally wrong. The individual can't judge and give a reward for the good behavior or the bad behavior. Ultimately, he can't. Now, in some cases, there may be the case that, that goodness is rewarded and and evil is punished. But ultimately, all wickedness is not punished in this life, and all goodness is not rewarded. How is that going to take place then? How is that going to happen? It's going to happen because behind the scenes, there is a righteous judge. Now listen. Now listen. Everybody then is going to be judged according to something. Listen, for we must... All, this is 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, good or bad, and we're going to be judged by it? Well, do you want me to determine if you've been good or bad? 
Are you going to let somebody else do it? I tell you what, if God does it, he's a righteous judge. He can determine what's, what's good and what's bad because ultimately he set the standard. See, when people talk about good and bad and they talk about moral and immoral, again, they're, they're admitting that there is a standard somewhere that we all have to be held accountable to. And if there's not one in this life, then it has to be in the next life. The very fact that there's a moral law implies that there is a realm in which we will be judged by that moral law. And God, the righteous judge, is going to hold everybody accountable to that moral standard on the day of judgment. Now I know individuals they, they don't want to you know they don't want, they want to go around the mountain and they say ah, I didn't see anything. Oh friends, if you went around the mountain, you're going to realize that morality cannot be defined by man, but ultimately has to be defined by God. And God is a righteous judge. Genesis uh, Genesis 18 and verse 25. Abraham Abraham says that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked. See, God does not slay the righteous with the wicked. He's a just God. Now, do you think there's ever been a time when righteous people have been killed with the wicked? Oh, yes. Do you ever think there's been a time when wicked people have been killed with righteous? Oh, yes. Do you think there's ever been a time when wicked, wicked people have been rewarded with the righteous? Oh, yes. But look, it is not God's manner to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. What do you mean do right? That's exactly what we're talking about. God is a righteous judge. Second Timothy, and he's going to know how to uh, put everybody, hold everybody to that standard of right and wrong. Paul said, henceforth there is laid of me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me at, at that day and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. God is a righteous judge. And God is, knows how to uh, give rewards and punishment. In Luke, four, uh, Luke 12 and verse 48, uh, Luke 12, let's back up to verse uh, 47. And, the Lord, and, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to, uh, to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Now look at the degrees here. He's going to be punished. But notice this in verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever uh, much is given, of him shall much be acquired. And to uh, whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Friends, we have a great responsibility because we're going to be held to a standard that God has put in place. And God is righteous, and he's just, and he's merciful, but he's also, he's also a flaming fire who will take vengeance on the wicked. Now, the standard of morality, who's going to be right and who's going to be wrong, ultimately has to come down to one thing. It has to come down to a standard that God has put in place. Now, people can say, well, I don't want, I don't want religion, I don't want, I don't want religion, I just want morality without it. Ultimately, friends, you cannot have it. You cannot have uh, you cannot have morality you cannot have morality without the Bible. You just can't do it. And so that's what we're, we're trying to show you. Common ground, common ground, understanding why we can, or how we can all be together, it's going to come together based upon this book. Unity, being on the same page means let's start with what God has said. Let's call what God has said righteous. Let's do what God says and be righteous. And let's call what God says evil, evil. And then we'll be on the same page with God too. Friends, I hope this has helped. I hope this has helped us all be on the same page. And I hope you know that if, if you come and visit with us, we'll be glad to see you. We'll study the Bible with you. We'll warmly, warmly welcome you. And we look forward to seeing you uh, each 
each night that we are here, and we hope that you will come out and visit with us and study the Bible with us. We're out of time, so I'm going to sign off. And if you'd like to copy this program, here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653. Until next time, thanks for watching. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. Thursday edition of Star News. I'm Mark Childry. Glad to have you here. Boy, we have a lot of news for you today, including uh, some weather-related news. That's all coming up in this hour. And we also have crime news. We have news out of Reedsville, North Carolina. A fraud case under investigation. Reedsville police detectives hope that maybe you might recognize the individual from a surveillance photograph. We've got that coming up for you. We also have a robbery that was reported early this morning. It was reported in Stokesdale, North Carolina. It's actually in Guilford County where the robbery happened, but that's very, very close to the Rockingham County line. So Rockingham County viewers, pay attention. Stokes County viewers, please pay attention. We've got the picture in just a moment. You might recognize this individual. You could line your pockets with some reward money. Debbie Moore is out today, but the United Way report will go on as planned, and yours truly will be hosting that. We'll do 